my first question to you is actually a very simple one. This has been a crazy year for you and your family. Um, can you just tell us, first of all, how are you doing? How's your family doing? And what is the latest on your family home in Sheikh Jarrah? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been good and uh, my family has been good. You know, it's really good for them to have a community to go through this together with and they're not alone in this. Um, in terms of the rec most recent updates, um, we are still awaiting uh, dispossession order. We're still waiting the court to make a ruling because they have offered us a quote unquote agreement between us and the settlers that would allow us to stay in our homes for a few years before we would ultimately be again rendered homeless. So we said no to this agreement because we still, we still believe unanimously in the righteousness of our gods and we believe that we own our homes. So we said no to the agreement for, with the settlers and now we're awaiting what happens. But I want to say, take, to take this opportunity to say that the um, situation is not just the situation, the danger and the risk of dispossession, the danger of homelessness, of being replaced by settlers is not just one that affects my community, but rather the larger community of Jerusalem. In the nearby neighborhood like Silwan, you have 80 plus families about to lose their homes to demolition orders to be replaced with a biblical, quote unquote, biblical um, park. You have in a nearby um, neighborhood of Isawi, you have families also facing the similar prospect. So this um, ongoing ethnic dispossession of Palestinians from Jerusalem is still happening and continuous and it's still a huge risk. Your story and the story of your family and all the other communities that you're talking about, they are not new, although they may be new to a Western audience just within the last year uh, because of the events that transpired, but they were not new. And you and I actually spoke in November and I had been following your story even years before that. Can you talk to us about your efforts to try and get the spotlight on what was happening in East Jerusalem? I mean, I, I remember seeing you as a young child, you and Muna talking about that in, in a Just Vision documentary, but talk to us over the years, how hard was it for you to try and get what has now happened, which is an international spotlight on, on the communities of East Jerusalem? Yeah, I think I just found a really good angle, you know, because it's been, <laughs> it's been going on since 1972, and we in Palestine have been so desensitized to our own oppression. Yani, I remember getting the call from my family in October, a month before you interviewed me, um, about getting an eviction notice from the court, and I was like, oh my God, here we go again, I have to do interviews, because it's been like a theme of my life, my whole entire life. And I had to convince myself to do it, because in my mind I think like, oh, we're gonna lose our home, it's not as bad as you know, getting your home demolished, or having your entire family bombed. Um, and there's this hierarchy of oppression that forces you to kind of be silenced. Um, but this time around, decided not to be silenced, and we decided that there's a crisis and there's an urgency to this, and we just have to articulate it in a way that rings true to the to the urgency of the situation on the ground. And we, you know, I sent that first email. We reached out to all of the media people we know, to all of the organizations we know, and we created a, a, a grassroots campaign. And you know, we're not the first people uh, to do anything like this, and this has been like the effort of thousands and thousands of people, not just my family, but it made me very proud to know that we defeated you know, a state with a Ministry of Strategic Affairs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you, when you sent out that first wave of trying to get um, the international spotlight and attention, what was the reception like? Because I think for a lot of us, and when I first heard about your story more recently in November, um, I immediately knew that this was going to be a contentious discussion and I didn't expect and I didn't anticipate that it would lead to the kind of violence that we saw in May, but certainly I anticipated that this was going to create a mobilization effort uh, in East Jerusalem, just from my experience of seeing what, what always is the threshold. But from your vantage point, talk to us about you know that first wave of communication you guys tried to do in organizing. What was the reception like? Were people like, no, we're not interested, we don't understand it, we don't want to cover it, we don't want to touch it. Yeah, I mean, definitely people, there was this reluctance to talking about this, first of all, because like it happens all the time, who cares that a Palestinian family is going to be displaced? That's the first thing, but then because, because of the language, you know, I use the terms ethnic cleansing to describe what's going on, and there were fights behind the scenes on the phone. We were fight I was fighting with journalists trying to get them to use my, my words because they just completely wanted to call it an eviction. And you know, we were able to establish the case that you know, when you have uh, an entire army of militarized police, hundreds and hundreds of them, when you have settlers that are wielding their own rifles, when you have a judicial system that is working together with settler organizations that are billionaire backed and working outside of the United States, 
um, attacking this refugee of communities, I mean this community of refugees, this is not necessarily an eviction, it does not look like an eviction. And that was a very clearly um, believable and convincing case because it's what you saw on the ground. And we were able to make that breakthrough. And to the receiving audience, to the world, the difference between ethnic displacement, forced dispossession, and eviction is a huge difference. And it, it's what really sparked this mobilization. This is not to take away from the heft and the risks that come with eviction and how impoverished communities, particularly in the United States, are forcibly evicted by gentrification and whatnot. But again, what's happening on the ground in Jerusalem against Palestinians is forcible transfer of a population from one place to another, which is illegal under international law and is a war crime. The senior advisor to the Israeli prime minister at the time, Mark Regev, called it a real estate dispute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does it look like a real estate dispute to you? I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I'm the one asking the questions tonight. So yeah, I, <laughs> I know you're a journalist, but let, this is a one-way conversation. No, it right is, it is yeah. a real estate dispute. You know, God is the real estate agent, and he gave them the land, and we're just, you know. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to ask you about the impact that you and your sister and the others who began to broadcast using social media had. And we'll get into the specifics of what many Palestinian activists believe to be censorship or at least the manipulation of the algorithm within social media to try and if at the very least not silence but to marginalize Palestinian voices that were reporting on the ground. Talk to us about the, the moment you decided that you actually have a tool in your own hand that was allowed to bypass the traditional media institutions of the world and speak directly to a global audience? And what was that reception like when you began doing that? Yeah, mean, do, I, do you remember the first time that you did it? Yeah, I mean, I, we understood, Yanni, from a, this is not necessarily things I say out loud in the media because I think it's not that important, but we, when we were first started, in this, we were, when we were first starting to design the campaign, we decided, we thought like, we needed the most um, basic, slogan to go, that memorable slogan, repeatable slogan, and this is where Saif Shazarah came from. And um, that was the first step. But also because I lived in the United States for four years and understanding the news cycle, the news cycle is informed by social media. This, the past 10 years, social media has dominated kind of what um, pundits say on TV, what journalists say on TV. And we re recognized by penetrating social media, we were able to penetrate the news cycle and force you know, Palestine at the center of the news cycle. And we just communicated this to the people that were following our cause and we said like, we are the news cycle. Um, and of course this was, you know, people say it's, be it's because of social media, but I would say it was because of, in spite of social media. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of censorship going on, documented. Just a few weeks ago there was um, a whistleblower report from Facebook that, dis that revealed that my account being demoted was being discussed among you know Facebook employees, and this cert cert certainly rings true for more and more Palestinians, not just me. So the the, the being able of going around the algorithms, going around um, censorship, was a complete success for Palestinians and their allies everywhere. It, it sounds to me, and, and this is kind of new to me, but you, it, it sounds like there was a concerted effort that you worked with within the community and organizers. It yeah. wasn't just you started broadcasting no. and next thing you know it became viral, right? No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, talk to us a little bit about that. Like, who else was in that organizing committee? How did you guys come up with this idea? Uh, it, shed light on it if you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is going to get me in trouble, but for like, since 1972, we had a community for Sheikh Jarrah, a committee of Sheikh Jarrah, defending Sheikh Jarrah, and it composed mainly of our, our parents and our grandparents. And they've been struggling so hard for decades and decades on end, but they did not necessarily understand social media. And they did not understand what goes, quote unquote, viral and what reaches an audience. And there was this kind of conflict between me and my father, for example. And um, there was this conflict between us, the younger generation in the, in the neighborhood and the, and the older generation, because they wanted to play it by the book. They wanted to call it an eviction because they didn't want to upset the courts. They said, if we call it an eviction, we just pleaded for anti-discrimination laws, um, it wouldn't accept, accept the courts and then they would keep our homes. But we've maintained that for the decades we've been f fighting for our homes, we've already lost five homes in Sheikh Jarrah and we've maintained that that status quo is not successful. 
by calling it settler colonialism, not only do you accurately and objectively reflect what's going on on the ground of having a native population replaced by settlers, but this umbrella term rings true for other Palestinians and other communities who are facing displacement um, through other names, like home demolitions or uh, green saving and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and we, I didn't do it by myself, yani, not, none of us did. We, we had to establish a speech, a rhetoric, we had to establish connections with different media organizations that were working on the ground, and all of our campaign was entirely grassroots informed. And you know, today I have a large platform, and I recognize that whenever I want to make a statement, I can't just make a statement because unfortunately, it's unfair to me, but it's unfortunately true that there's not many Palestinians in the public eye. So what I say is kind of representative of, of Palestinians. So now whenever I want to make a large statement, I make sure to consult with different various organizations, various movements to get their viewpoint on things. And that way you kind of establish a good diplomatic rhetoric. And by, when I say diplomatic, I don't mean wishy-washy. I just yeah. mean it's good. So is that, uh, do you feel a sense of, is it a burden or is it a privilege that you have this platform with hundreds of thousands of followers and you speak on behalf of a community that has been marginalized in silence. What do you think? It's terrible. No, I'm kidding. It's no, no, I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I, I listen, you're, you were very vocal and I think part of your authenticity is what also brought a lot of attention to the issue. But as you mentioned, you now have a responsibility. Uh, whether you like it or not, you have become, you and your sister have become to a certain extent the voice of that community, maybe in large part because you have lived in America, you speak English. Those are, you know, those are realities of the media climate that we work in. Mm -hmm. Is it a burden or is it a privilege? It's an obligation. Mm. That's, that's the word I like to choose because I don't hate doing it. Um, I love doing it actually, but there is a burden that comes with it. There's a lot of heft to having this kind of platform. Um, I will say that, you know, sometimes people, um, you know, people, for example, people in Gaza are often mad at me because they don't speak as much about Gaza, mm. which is so true. Like, we only tend to mention Gaza, Gaza, as you guys say it. <laughs> uh, we only tend to mention it when it's getting bombarded. Um, but as much as I want to talk about it, I don't have the authority to narrate Gaza. I don't have the arrogance of uh, an American journalist who get, thinks they can go to Gaza. You know, and be like, here with you live, Chad from the Gaza Strip. I don't have that. <laughs> and I wish, Yanni, we have... <laughs> and, you know, I, I wish, I, Yanni, as much as I learn and I write about it, but I think the next phase in this is, is to empower other Palestinians because we exist across the stretches of desperate geographies, of desperate legal statuses. We are facing this... Um, dispossession differently if you're not getting demolished you're getting bombed if you're not getting bombed you're getting evicted if you're not getting evicted your residency is getting revoked and you need people who are able to narrate that with authority and yes it's wonderful that I'm in the in the in the public eye I'm in the spotlight but it would be even more powerful if organizations media organizations were able to make structural changes to implement Palestinians who have the authority to speak about certain things. And when I mean like implement Palestinians, I don't mean hiring an intern to grab you coffee, but correspondence. In my defense, I started off as an intern, so I will, I will <laughs> and, I did, and I did grab a lot of coffee, and I did do, and in my time, there were a lot of fax machines. We didn't have email, so I had to rip the fax machine and go give it to the reporters who would then read the, but all that to say is like, I, I think it's, it's about the journey of where you start, yes. and, and you should not be discouraged if there are any young journalists in here and you are an intern, it's okay, stay in it. It pays off at the end. But, but, but yes, we, yes. before we get to the critique of American media, and, and there, believe me, there is a lot to critique about American media. I just, wanna, I just wanna wrap up on you a little bit, which is you've recently been appointed as... Uh, Palestine correspondent. Yeah, Palestine correspondent for the nation. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Um, you're also a poet. I think so. <laughs> we, we have the books to suggest that you are a poet, so we'll go, we'll go with that. Um, and on top of that, you are, uh, and you came to prominence as an activist. And here's where it gets a little bit interesting. What do you see yourself as going forward? I like to call myself a writer because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's an umbrella term. And I want, uh, and a writer, I want, I want to be able to narrate. You know, I think this is so much a battle between people about land and about refugees and about prisoners 
but it's also a fight of narration. It's a fight about who gets to tell the story. And for us Palestinians, we live a reality that's so materially evident, um, and yet the way that it's being articulated in the world is inaccurate, is inconsistent with the reality that we live. So I see my role as a person who is able to bridge that cab or close that chasm between the articulations that we make on the street in Arabic and the way they are reported on in English, in media. And that's my ultimate goal. So you now, you write for The Nation, would you, do you write as a journalist or do you write as a opinion writer? Journalist. Purely journalist, yes, not opinion. it's horrible. <laughs> I gotta tell you. No, it's, because I have such an urge to like write poetically and be like, yeah, this government sucks, but I can't say that as a journalist. So it's taken, it's been a wonderful challenge, to be honest, uh, you know, I, I wanted to report on um, the designation of six Palestinian civil society organizations as terrorist organization, which is the Israeli government's latest attempt to stifle Palestinian, you know, documentation and analysis. And I, in, I ended up interviewing about 24 people for the essay just because I didn't feel like I was qualified to speak about it without being biased. And that kind of insecurity that came with me becoming a journalist after being a poet, uh, is, is, you know, it's a small burden of insecurity, but it's also very helpful because it pushes me to be rigorous in the way yeah. I report. Yeah, and, and you've now crossed the line from being able to freely express yourself to now having to work within a structure that includes, I assume, editors, yes. uh, perhaps even a legals and standards department. Yes, fact checkers. Fact checkers. <laughs> welcome, welcome, to the world of, uh, welcome to the world of American media. By the way, let, let, to be honest, that exists in every news yes. organization. It, it exists at Al Jazeera, it exists yes. in European news organizations. So as much as we want to pretend that that doesn't exist, there are layers in the process. Yeah. What has that been like for you as someone who, I remember went on TV and social media and said the things that you said, can you now say them in the same context in the same way as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, my fact checker is always like source, and I'm just like, what do you mean? I'm telling you, it's <laughs> true. It's like, it's my house, I live here, I can tell you what's happening. Like, do you have a second source in your house who can confirm to you that the gas actually landed inside the house? <laughs> So, um, the, the, but you know, this is, this, this is true. There is fact checkers, there's my editor, yeah. who's wonderful, but my editor who's like constantly asking me for sources and Have they been on the ground? Have they ever been to Jerusalem? No, I don't think so. Okay. But for me, it's, it hasn't been a challenge to voice my opinion because facts are facts. What's happening on the ground is what's happening on the ground. So by simply portraying things appropriately, by simply rendering the painting of um, this power imbalance very accurately, people make up their own conclusions and often these conclusions are aligned with my own opinions because the facts on the ground scream of asymmetry, scream of um, oppression, and scream of injustice. What have you learned so far about the structural challenges working for an American publication like The Nation? Which we should note is progressive, it, yes. it is left-leaning. Yes. Um, but what have you learned about the structural challenges? I mean, um, my editor is wonderful. I love her to death. Um, the structural challenges has just been like the bureaucracy of this is just waiting until we can, we're able to get something out. And then just like the extra task of, you know, putting a hyperlink every few words, <laughs> hyperlinking them to death. <laughs> so it's been more stru it's been more processed than it is editorial, you would say? Yeah, no, no, I haven't had problems editorially with my editor, mm -hmm. and I think I just got lucky. I've worked with many different news outlets to publish opinion pieces, and even as an opinion um, writer, you are challenged on your own opinions. Right. So I was very surprised to see that I'm not being challenged on my reporting as much with my by my editor. But I think she's just on the right side of history. Would you be? <laughs> <laughs> no. Would you be allowed to go? And would you want to go and cover Israel? If the nation called you and said, "We want to send you to do a story," you can because you have an East Jerusalem ID. Yes. You can go to Tel Aviv. You can go report inside. Uh, Israel in 1948 lines, even if you can't get to Gaza and have a hard time getting into the West, West Bank, would you go cover Israel? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Their politics are just as corrupt. Yeah. But you would do it, you have no reservations about reporting on it? No. Okay. Um, you were talking- I think the Palestinian stories are much more valuable, but I would do it if my job- Required. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the challenge is when you get an assignment and you have to report on it from across, you, I was just, 
curious to know if you would. So, I would, yeah. yeah. Um, you talked about the broader media landscape in the US, and we will open it up to questions in a little bit. So I, if you have questions, we'll take them shortly. I don't that want one was really hard. <laughs> that one was hard? Yeah, no. That you don't cover? Yeah, I had to think on my feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, it's a, it's a friendly crowd here. I mean, I don't think anyone is going to be upset if you say you have to go cover Israel. I mean, but I... I